Well, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And welcome to another Wednesday edition of Virtual Bible Study at the New Hope Baptist Church. I'm your host, Pastor Harold Miller Jr. Thank God for all of you who are wishing and sharing with us in this virtual Bible study. We thank God for all of you. And uh, hopefully uh, this, um, this video, this lesson we're going to present tonight will be a blessing to you. And if it'll be a blessing to you, I'm sure it'll be a blessing to someone else. And so as we always do, we encourage you to share it on your Facebook page. Tonight, we're going to be talking about sacred space, sacred space, where God dwells on earth. Talking about the concept of sacred space, maybe something new uh, for most of you, but it's a very important subject, a very important topic, runs throughout all the Bible. And uh, something we need to take a look at. We're going to be talking about sacred space where God dwells on earth. In the meantime, we want to thank all of you who have been faithful in sharing in this ministry. Uh, listen, since the pandemic, uh, many of you have been faithful in your giving. Uh, those of you who are members of the church, and even those of you who are our online supporters, we thank God for you. Listen, I was talking with a pastor just yesterday, and he was sharing with me some things that's going on in his congregation, and he has decided to uh, to cease his online presence because of what you know his rationale, his mind, his thinking. He wants to uh, you know encourage the members to come back to the to the physical church. Uh, and physical worship, uh, and so he's going to cease online activity to give them uh, that opportunity to do that. Uh, but you know, I have a different mindset. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, through this medium of Facebook, that God has given us in, an incredible opportunity to reach people that we've never reached before, and uh, so we're going to keep our online presence. Uh, for Wednesday night and for Sunday morning, uh, because I think it's it's just too vitally important. Uh, it's more important to reach people than to, really to actually see them in your church building, in my opinion. And so that's what we're persuaded to do. And uh, I just thank God for all of you who are sharing uh, with this ministry. Uh, we picked up some old friends from years ago who are 
sowing diligently every month into this ministry. I encourage those of you who might happen to see this video who may not be associated with the church. If you'd like to share this ministry, we encourage you to do so. Uh, you can do so by PayPal. Uh, I'll, you know, PayPal, I think it's uh, paypal.me forward slash New Hope Cub. Or you can just put uh, New Hope Baptist Church uh, in the um, in the search box. I believe you have to search by uh, email and PayPal. So if you want to do that, that's that's New Hope Cub at Comcast.net. That should get you to us. And also, uh, you can we're using Giblify. Uh, you can put in the church physical address, which is twenty two zero seven. Uh, Brown Street, Southwest, Covington, Georgia, 30014. And I believe that'll get you to us uh, by uh, by means of Givelify. Now, listen, wherever you are, if you'd like to sow a seed um, through the U.S. mail, you're welcome to do that. And our mailing address is P.O. Box, that's New Hope Baptist Church, P.O. Box 205. Covington, Georgia, 30015 is the zip for the uh, P.O. box. And if you should decide that you want to give something and share something with, with me or Dr. Miller personally, we certainly welcome that. My cash app handle is a dollar sign Harold. That's H-A-R-O-L-D-8860. At, uh, and uh, Dr. Miller is uh, the dollar sign Holy Holy. Zero three one five. But whatever you decide to do, we're not pressing you. We're not trying to press you. We're not trying to put a guilt trip on you. But listen, if you want to give, we certainly welcome that, and we know the Lord will bless you for doing so. Well, listen, as we pray tonight, I want to remind you of our prayer ministry that goes on every Thursday. We have a call-in prayer line every Thursday night from eight p.m. until eight. 30 p.m. and that's Eastern Standard Time. And the number for you to call in for that is 774-220-4020. Again, that's 774-220-4020. And once you call that number, the access code to get into the conference is 372-1137, followed by the pound sign. Speaking of prayer, there's so much going on. Now, listen, 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 listen. I was I was just surfing uh, the web earlier this morning, the news, and it's just so much going on. I mean, I mean, it's everywhere. There's gun violence. There's killing. There's uh, is is uh, we are suffering from an epidemic of inhumane treatment. To one another, I mean, I, you know, it, it's just ridiculous how insensitive and how cold-hearted and how cold-blooded people can be. I was reading a story this morning uh, where a a young lady in Houston, Texas, uh, killed her sister. I mean, her sister uh, said something to the police uh, to the effect that she had some 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 drugs or something, and she, you know, she shot her sister. Uh, uh, tried to get a boyfriend ex-boyfriend that helped conceal the body he refused ended up forcing her 13 year old son to help her move the body transport the body in the car took the body to some location dumped her sister out on the road and, and set the body on fire i mean your own blood sister i mean gosh and and, and of course we're praying for we're praying for the family of Brittany macon that's the young lady who was killed just the other day in Atlanta at the Subway shop. Uh, customer irate uh, said she put too much mayonnaise on her on his sandwich. I mean, my God. And so he killed her about that and also shot another uh, worker there. Uh, this young lady is Jaden uh, Stanton, I believe is her name. She was 24. Brittany was 26, the one who was killed. Uh, Jada, who was also, I believe she was shot twice. Uh, and her Jada's five-year-old son was there at the shop with him, and he he witnessed this. Uh, but she's in critical condition in the hospital. Ask you to lift her up in prayer too. Wow, that she that she will recover 
uh, from this. We're praying also uh, for the families of some young people in our community who recently passed. Uh, Kamisha Neal was funeralized on yesterday. Uh, Jaden Blackwell was funeralized on the weekend. Uh, and I believe just yesterday, uh, uh, Belinda Clark, who is uh, from our community, I believe she was living in Conyers, but she's originally from Covington, uh, just passed yesterday, young people. And so we, we're lifting up the, their families. We, we're lifting up also the Reed family. Uh, Tom Reed's aunt in the person of uh, Cora Reed Hodges uh, passed Sunday, passed Sunday as we were in service, she passed Sunday. And uh, so her service is going to be, funeral is gonna be Saturday at, uh, let's see, it's at 1 p.m. at Faith of Jesus Ministry, that's on Ursa Road here in Covington. Uh, and Young Levitt Funeral Home is assisting the family uh, viewing is from 1 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Friday, July the 1st at the Covington Chapel. So lift up Brother Tom and the rest of his family in your prayers as they deal with the passing of his aunt. I believe that was his father's uh, sister. Also, our own uh, sister, Cece Hector, her mother-in-law, her husband's uh, mother, in the person of Linda Howard is on life support. And uh, so um, we're lifting her up in our prayers as well. We're also praying for our own uh, mother, Florine Wilburn, and we're praying for Mother Betty Jackson. My God, there's so much going on. We need to be praying for our young people, praying for our nation, praying for our world. Jesus said, listen, he said, because iniquity would abound, the love of many, will wax cold. And I believe that's that's what we're living in now. People are so cold-hearted, so callous. But I want to encourage you, my friend, to not let what's happening all around you cause your love to wax cold. Be, be what God called you to be. Remember, we show our love for God and to God by loving one another. Jesus said by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, not by how we sing, not by how we preach, not by how we pray, but how we love, how we love one another. And we also need to love not just one another as far as Christian brothers and sisters, but we need to love the world uh, because they, they, are, they are in need of God's grace and mercy. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer, and then we'll be coming forth with our lesson for tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, here we are again. And God, as we come, we thank you uh, for just being such a good God. We thank you, God, that, that your mercy uh, would not uh, uh, give us what we deserve. And your grace gives us what we don't deserve. And so, Father, we thank you for your mercy and we thank you for your grace. Father, we talked about so many situations where people were, were killed. Some of them were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we realized, God, it could have been us. It could have been very well been us. And so we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Father, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you, God. And we lift up their families. We lift up the family of um, Brittany Macon, the young lady, 26-year-old, uh, just was on the job uh, less than a month. Uh, God, we just, we just can't imagine uh, what her family is going through. So we lift them up to you. We, we are praying, God. We're praying mightily uh, for Jada Statham, God, that you would just touch her body uh, and, and, and return her to a reasonable portion of health and strength, God. And we're praying also for the, for the young man who, who has been apprehended for doing this. If you just take hold of the reign of his mind, not just his mind, but there's so many other people, God, who, who are just short-tempered and, and, and have guns. And God, we just pray uh, that we'll become more civilized 
It, it seems as if the more intelligent we become, the more sophisticated we become, the more cruel we become to one another. And so we just pray, God, that the milk of human kindness will not dry up, but that it will continue to flow and that your love will continue to flow and that we will learn to, to, to settle our disagreements, not with violence, but with dialogue and, and, and the constructive uh, uh, strategy that, that, um, that will not result in the loss of life over foolishness. And then God, we pray for uh, our, 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 our friend, um, Cece's mother-in-law. God, that you just touch her body right now. We're praying for uh, our brother Hector, that you just strengthen him and the rest of the family. And God, that they, as, they, as they seek, oh God, to just uh, continue to lift that mother up in prayer, that you just touch her body. Lord, we pray for uh, the Neal family. We pray for the, the Blackwell family. We pray for the Clark family. God, as they deal with the, the, the transition of such young people, uh, God, mo uh, most of them were not even 30 years old or barely 30. Uh, uh, Jaden was just 19. Uh, I believe Kamisha was 29. I'm not sure of Belinda's age. But God, whatever, the, whatever, that, whatever that situation is, God, just, just comfort them as only you can. God, we lift up the Reed family as, as uh, they deal with the transition of uh, Corey Reed Hodges. And God, we just pray that uh, for Tom and his family, that you would just comfort them, God, as only you can. We lift up Sister Florine Wilburn, Mother Wilburn, God. She's dealing with some health issues. But God, we know you are the great physician. Just touch her body even right now. We continue to lift up uh, Mother Betty Jackson. And God, we thank you for Deacon Clark that he's on the men. And uh, we just lift him up. And then not only them, God, those are the ones we know by name and, and, and call by name. But there's so many others uh, that we can't recall and so many others that we don't even know about. But God, that, that is not frustrating to us. Because we know that you know all about them. And so just touch them, oh God. Whatever they stand in the need of, we pray that you'll just do it even now. According to their faith in your will. Now, God, give us revelation as we seek to study your word, this concept of sacred space tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Again, as we said earlier tonight, we're going to be talking about sacred space where God dwells on earth. Sacred space where God dwells on earth. Maybe something uh, new uh, for many of you. And uh, perhaps you have not heard of the term before. But hopefully, after tonight, it will help you understand this concept, how important it is, and uh, how you can uh, incorporate that in your faith walk with the Lord. Sacred space, where God dwells on earth. So let's, uh, let's look at some things. Uh, the concept of sacred space, as well as the concept of cosmic geography. We're not going to talk too much about cosmic, cosmic geography tonight. Uh, I mention it because, because of how it inter, intermingles or intertwines with sacred space. Uh, but these, these concepts run throughout the Bible. Now, what is sacred space? Well, according to the Lexham Theological Word Book, sacred space is any space or area that has been dedicated to God or set apart as a special place for the presence of God or for worship. Again, any space or area 
that has been dedicated to God or set apart as a special place for the presence of God or for worship. That's the lexum. That's the definition of sacred space according to the Lexham Theological Word Book. The Dictionary of Biblical Emergy, Emergy says that sacred place, sacred space rather, is a place where God is encountered in a special or direct way by virtue of which the very place becomes holy and set apart from ordinary space. And I have my own one sentence definition uh, of sacred space being a location that is holy or sanctified because of God's pronounced presence. And I need to under, you need to understand that the terms holy and sanctified in the Bible are synonymous. Uh, they mean set apart. only for the use of God or set apart by God. So when we talk about sacred space, we talk about a place or a location that is holy or sanctified because of God's pronounced presence. Now I just mentioned cosmic geography, so let me let me let me talk about that for a second. Uh, cosmic geography is the belief that certain locations were under the dominion of Pacific divine beings. And, and you run across this in the Bible and you, you probably didn't understand what was going on. But in ancient times, many of the Israelites believed that even Yahweh, the Lord, and, and notice where I have this term, the Lord, where you see any time in the Bible, if you look looking throughout your Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, when you see the word Lord, L-O-R-D, in all caps, it is a substitution for the divine name of God, which is Yahweh or Yehovah. Yehovah or Yahweh. Yahweh or Yehovah. Okay? With the Y. Not Jehovah, Yehovah. Because there is no J sound in the Hebrew uh, phonetic system. Is Yahweh. That's why that's why Joshua, we we say Joshua, uh, the Hebrews would have said Yeshua. Yeshua Yeshua. Well, yeah, Yeshua. So, but they believe that even Yahweh was restricted by cosmic geography. And that's that's why you have this this uh this question, that was the rationale behind the question that they asked in Psalms 137 and 4. And this is the Psalm that talks about how their captives required of them mirth, required them to sing a song. And they said in verse 4, how can we sing the Lord's song, King James says, in a strange land, uh, New American Standard says, in a foreign land. And the reason why they said that, they were in Babylon, they were down by the rivers of Tebar. In Babylon, they, they say they wept when they remembered Zion. And according to their concept of cosmic geography, they left Yahweh back in Israel. And this was, this was, this was cosmic geography. And so that's why they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We're in the land that is under the, the dominion of another God. Okay. Uh, this belief is also the reason that Naaman, you know, there's a strange thing that happened in the story of Naaman in 2 Kings. Remember, Naaman was the Syrian general who had uh, leprosy and he was healed by the prophet Elisha. And one of the things he asked of Elisha when he went was going back to uh, Syria, you know, he wanted to he wanted to worship the God of, of, of the Hebrews, 
but he was, you know, he was the right hand man of the king of Syria, and they they worship another god. And he asks for permission, you know, that you know be excused when he goes into the their place of worship to worship that other god, but he really wants to worship Yahweh. But here's here's why I brought it here. In verse 17 of chapter 5 of 2 Kings, uh, Naaman makes a strange request. He says, uh, verse 17 says, and Naaman said, if not, please let your servant at least be given two mule loads of earth for your servant will no more offer burnt offering nor will he sacrifice to other gods but to the lord and there is the lord l-o-r-d in cap but to yahweh so what he wanted to do he wanted to take two mule loads of dirt because the, the land, the physical land was tied to the particular God. And so he, and he couldn't be in Israel. So he took Israel back to Syria with him in the person of that dirt. And what he will probably do is when he got ready to worship, he would spread out the dirt in his section wherever and worship God. He was, he was thinking about this concept of cosmic geography and sacred faith. Now, it is because of our general ignorance of cosmic geography that we, I think we miss something. Uh, you know, that famous passage that we're so familiar with, uh, where Jesus asks his disciples, you know, who do, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And uh, they said, you know, you so and some say you're so and so, some say you're Elijah, some say this. Then it says, who do you say I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God. You know, and we, you know, we we talk about that, but there is some significance as far as cosmic geography is concerned, as to the location of where this takes place, and it takes place. Uh, in a place called Caesarea Philippi, which, which was in the northern region. It was not in Israel proper. It was in the northern region of that territory. They were not in Israel where this happened. Now, this is significant because when you look at the concept of cosmic geography, how does this fit in? Well, at the very spot where Jesus made that declaration, or where, where Peter made that declaration, they were in a place that was literally called, or literally known as, the gates of hell. It was a place where, according to Jewish folklore, that the sons of God that are mentioned in, I, in um, um, Genesis chapter six, when they came down and cohabited with human women, this is the point where it is believed they came down on Mount Hermon. And so this was, this was significant because Jesus was going to, 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 to the devil's front door and declaring war. But we miss that uh, because we don't we don't recognize uh, this concept of cosmic geography. But that's why cosmic geography is so important uh, as as it relates to sacred space. So as I said earlier, cosmic geography is a study that is too is extensive to combine with this study that I just mentioned in passing. But the, the, the purpose of this study uh, is to trace, and we're gonna only trace, we're not gonna go into too much depth and detail, because I don't want to get you uh, bogged down in technical stuff. But we're gonna, only gonna trace the progression of a concept 
of sacred space in the Bible. And you'll see before we finish how it's pertinent or relevant to us. So because of the amount of information that pertains to sacred space, this study will only touch briefly on introductory concepts or introductory issues and uh, examples. Now this study is important because as we survey the concept of sacred space in the Bible, uh, we're gonna observe a significant change that greatly impacts our theological understanding today. But I suggest that for the most part, uh, it has been largely ignored. I, I, I stumbled across this as I was preparing for a message a few weeks ago, and I shared it during that message. Uh, you might wanna reference that message neither here nor there. Uh, but a very important concept that I think that even the modern church today has, has totally ignored, but it's right there in black and white in our Bibles. In fact, it's not only in black and white, if you, it's in red because it's something Jesus said. So when we talk about sacred space now, the original sacred space was Eden. Eden. When the Lord created the world, he prepared Eden for man's habitation. You gotta understand that when God created the material world, when he created the earth, he created a garden, a special place. You're talking about a prepared place for a prepared people where Eden was prepared, prepared for Adam and Eve habitation. It was a perfect paradise. But the rest of the earth was not like Eden. Eden was paradise, but the rest of the earth was not. The rest of the earth was wild and uninhabited and needed to be cultivated. Now, Eden was sacred space because we, we, when man sinned, we found out that perhaps it was uh, common and uh, traditional or usual for Adam and Eve to commune with God in the garden in the cool of the day. And so that's why God comes and he says, where are you? Because they're not where they normally would be. They're hiding from God. And so, you know, immediately something's wrong. Of course, God knew where they were, but the fact that they're hiding uh, in the way the text is worded suggests to us that it was a regular occurrence it was a routine, it was a habit for Adam and Eve to commune with God in the cool of the day. Now, man's assignment, and here we go back to this, to this passage, Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 28. I can't, I can't stress enough that that passage is a core passage, is a cornerstone passage in understanding the will of God the original intent of God, God's purpose for creating humanity and our purpose for existence, the dominion mandate. Where he said, let us make man in our image and our likeness let, and let them have dominion. It also explains how God works in the earth. We talked about that in the prior lesson, okay? But man's dominion assignment was to multiply have dominion and to subdue the earth, transforming the entire earth into Eden. In other words, originally God, God intended Eden was sacred space and God intended for man through multiplication to transform the whole earth into sacred space just as Eden was. However, we know because of sin, that instead of man exercise, excuse me, exercising dominion and transforming the rest of the earth into Eden, sin reigned and Eden became like the rest of the earth. So even mountains uh, were known as sacred space. 
have a passage here in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 3, first five verses, it says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, uh, Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God. Notice the terminology, the mountain of God, Mount Herup. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Now listen, it was not unusual because of that dry, arid condition. It was not unusual for bushes to catch on fire. What caught Moses' attention was not the fact that the bush was on fire. What caught Moses' attention was that the bush was on fire, but yet the bush was not consumed by the fire. Oh, I feel a preach coming on. Because listen, it's not the fact that you catch on fire for God that's going to attract the world's attention. It's going to be the fact that you catch on fire and you keep burning and burning and burning and burning and you're not consumed. So a lot of people catch on fire, they burn, they burn out. After a few weeks, you don't hear from them anymore. After a few years, they don't hear from them anymore. They're not excited anymore. But when you keep on burning and burning and burning, that's what will catch people's attention. So God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. And this is what he said. He said, draw not nigh hither. Don't come any closer. He said, but take your shoes off. Take, put your shoes off your feet. Why? Because the place whereupon you're standing is holy ground. He's saying to Moses, you are standing on sacred space because the presence of God was there. Now, mountains, not just by the Hebrews, but by all people in that area in ancient times, according to the ancient worldview, mountains were thought to be the dwelling places of the gods. Not just Yahweh, but the other gods as well. Uh, and this is why you, you have in the Bible where when they have these uh, other gods that you'll find that they had worshipped places for them on, on the mountaintops, the high places, because it was believed that the mountains were thought to be the dwelling places of the God. So uh, it was because of that, as I just said, that most of the shrines and the holy places of the Bible are on mountains. Uh, mountains were in sacred space. Uh, Mount Herop, we just talked about Mount Herop. This is where uh, Moses encountered God at the with the burning bush encounter. Uh, Mount Sinai, uh, where God gave Moses the law. Listen, it was because of God's presence on Mount Sinai that we find out that in Exodus 19 and 10 to 13, it's reiterated in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 20 that the people were not even allowed to touch the mountain lest they would die. It was so holy, so sacred. Of course, we got Mount Bethel. Mount Bethel, that was the site of Jacob's dream. You know, he had a dream. He saw angels descending and ascending of the heaven. And uh, as when Jacob woke up, he said, wow, surely God is in this place. Sacred space sacred space. Of course, now, as time goes on, this same concept is transferred uh, from mountains, not just mountains, but to the tabernacle. The tabernacle was this enormous tent that God instructed the, the Hebrews to build as they dwelled in the wilderness. It was a, it was a tent. Uh, because it was meant to be portable, but as they were on, move, on the move, they were to take down the tent, take down the tabernacle, and go from spot to spot. By the way, the 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 Levites were the only ones allowed, the only ones sanctified to put up or take down the tabernacle. Look what God said. He said, and let them make me a sanctuary. 
that I may dwell among them. The tabernacle was meant to be the temporary dwelling place of God as he dwelt among his people. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. God instructed Moses on how, how big it was, what was to be made of, the material that was to be included in it, in the making or the construction of the tabernacle. So that was why they were in the wilderness. Now, once they get into the promised land, promised land itself was also considered sacred space. But once they get into the promised land, uh, we get down to Solomon's and Solomon builds a temple. So we go from we go from mountains to the tabernacle to the temple. Uh, and so we have in Second Chronicles, it says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that came to Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and his own house, he prosperously affected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard thy prayer. Listen. I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. I'm skipping down, verse 15, verse 14, of course, is that passage we always quote, in my people which you call by my name. But verse 15 says, now my eyes shall be open and my ears attend or attentive unto the prayers that are made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. Now, when God talks about his name, he's talking about his character, his essence. He says, and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. He's talking about the temple, the temple. This is why the Hebrews thought that, listen, since, since we got the temple, you know, now, you know nothing's gonna happen to us. I mean, they didn't care how they lived. Because they believe that the presence of God's temple was insurance that God would not destroy them. Sacred space. Now, here's where it comes to us because I used to think, in fact, I've taught and preached, and preached this. And, and listen, let me tell you something. We're all growing, we're all learning. If, if when you get to the point, where you have a, you think you have a concept or an idea that's unchangeable, uh, you know, you might be in error. Because listen, God's word doesn't change, but our concept of it and our understanding of it should change as we grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I used to think, and I used to, I used to advocate that there was a direct line between the tabernacle, the temple, and contemporary houses of worship or the local church building. Uh, Jesus said again, I say to you, that if any two of you shall agree on, uh, on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And then he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. And so I was, you know, you know, we got to be gathered at the church. Got to be gathered at the church building. So that Jesus would be in the midst. But he said, wherever two or three, not necessarily in the church building. But if you if if he if he can get two or three of his believers to gather together in the supermarket, he's in the midst. On a street corner, he's in the midst. He did not specifically say in a building. Because guess what? At the time Jesus made that statement, there were no church buildings. Uh, the believers worship. They met in, in synagogues. The Jews, the Jews did. Uh, some of them still met in the temple. Uh, we're going to find out later on during the apostolic period. They had church houses, not church houses, but houses, but church in their house where they lived. So there were no church buildings. There were no buildings. Uh, nobody built a building during Jesus' time and said, hey, we're going to meet here as a church. Now, of course, during the pandemic, people use this verse in Hebrew, says, let us consider one another, provoke one another to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling ourselves together as a man of psalm is, 
but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. And people use that text, say, hey, we got to we gotta come to church. We got to meet in this building because that's what God says we have to do. But notice he says not for a second that assembling of ourselves together. It didn't say where. Okay. Because at the time the text was written, again, there were no church buildings. They met in their homes. They were met in house churches. I'm just going to read uh, uh, these passages so you can get an idea of what I'm, what I'm talking about. I've got the Romans chapter 16, verse 5, and this is this is toward the end where uh, Paul uh, you know, is greeting people. So let me just read so you'll, you'll have an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, but Paul says uh, in Romans chapter 16, verse 5, he's talking about Greek people. He says, also greet the church. Well, let's go back to the verse, verse 3. He says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own neck to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Okay? The church that is in their house. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, we, seem to, we see the same kind of language Paul says, the churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Prisca, Priscilla, same thing, greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house, okay? In their house, Colossians chapter four and verse 15, same idea. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15, same idea. Let's see what it says. Uh, yeah. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha in the church that is in her house. Okay. Philemon, Philemon, uh, chapter one, verse two. Again, same language, same language where Paul is talking about the church in, in someone's house, church in someone's house. And so we see this, this idea over and over and over again, particularly in the New Testament, that we have churches, there were no dedicated church buildings, but the church met in the homes of believers. The homes of believers. So, and this is what we mean by the apostolic church. We're talking the apostolic church, rather. We're talking about the church of the church that was established, the churches that were established during the time of the apostles, you know, Peter, James, and Paul, the churches Paul established and all like that. Note the use of the church that is in blank house, his house, their house, her house. There were no church buildings, but the church met in their house. So the church was the assembled people, not the building not the building or house where they were assembled. So when Jesus declared upon this rock, I'll build my church, he was not talking about building buildings. He was talking about building people. The ecclesia, the called out one. He said, literally, he says, upon this rock, I'll build my ecclesia. And that's the Greek word that we translate into church. That word ecclesia 
literally means called out ones. You've been called out from the world. It was a political term, really, that 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 that, that talked about called out citizens who were called out and designated to transact uh, the business of a municipality. What Jesus was literally saying was that just as Caesar has his senate, his ecclesia, I'm going to build my ecclesia, <coughs> excuse me, my called out one. So I think what we've done is that we, 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 we've been operating largely on a mistaken concept. Because unfortunately, the contemporary church has majored in building buildings instead of building people. Do you realize how much of the budget is dedicated or is consumed by the physical plant? You know, you've got loans, like you've got mortgages, you've got uh, 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 utility bills. You know, most of the church budget, the budget of the people of the church, is 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 dedicated toward that building, and and we're building bigger buildings. In fact, uh, most people judge the 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 um uh how can i say this i guess success or or vitality of a church based on the size of the building which is really unbiblical or non-biblical and and most people think of the church primarily as a building yeah and, and i think this is why so many people you know, during during the, during the height of the pandemic, so many people felt lost because they couldn't go to that building, not understanding that the church was not the building. The church was the people of the building, who people who assembled in the building. You know, they could assemble in the parking lot. They could assemble at the Walmart. They could assemble uh, online, virtually. So, in many ways, modern believers unknowingly subscribe to the ancient belief of cosmic geography by confining worship. In other words, what I mean by that is, is we've confined, we've confined worship, fellowship, and even God to the sado or the pseudo sacred spaces of church buildings. In other words, you know, we, we go to church to meet God. We go to that that spot, that building that we have designated as a sacred space. And I, I have pseudo as a false sacred space. And I, I want to share that with you in just a minute of why I use that term. And I use that because literally Jesus eliminated sacred space and, and so i said earlier most most believers and bible readers are unaware or simply have not realized the implications of jesus statement uh during the conversation with the woman of samaria but it was during that conversation that jesus literally eliminated geographical <laughs> sacred space The woman said to her to him, he said, she says, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Now, most time when we when we when we read this text, when we talk about this text, we, we talk about, you know, the woman had five husbands and all this kind of stuff. And we just so fascinated by that, you know. And and we and we miss this. But this is the most important thing in that conversation. She says, Our father was on this mountain. It's referring to Mount Gerizim. But you say that in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, is a place where people ought to worship. This is what this is what Jesus said to her. And I've got it in red here. 
because this is the important part. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. That's why, that's why I came up with the subject of the Sunday, neither here nor there. He said, you wish it what you do not know. We wish it what we know for salvation of the Jews. Here it is again in red. But the hour is coming and is now here. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now look at that. Look at the hour he's talking about. He said the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will, will you wish it. He said the hour is coming and it is, not, is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. You can't confine him to one location. You can't confine him to sacred space. Now, even though he designates sacred space in the Old Testament, you have to understand as you read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, God is dealing with people with what I call progressive revelation. In other words, there are some things or ways God dealt with people in the Old Testament that he did not deal with them the same way in the New Testament because he had grew them up or it should have grown or they should have grown up. Here's, here's an example. Uh, in the Old Testament, you have Naaman, not Naaman, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, who was that guy that put out the fleece? Uh, his, his name escapes me right now. Gideon. Gideon. Remember, Gideon puts out fleece. God says something to him, and Gideon says, oh, Lord, I can't believe that. No, no. He said, if it's really true, here's what I want you to do, Lord. He said, I'm going to put out this, I'm going to put out this, this, this sheepskin or whatever, and if, if you really want me to do this in the morning, I want the, I want the sheepskin to be wet but the ground around to be dry. And God did that. All right, he still can't believe it. So he says the next morning, he says, okay. He says, you know, I told you I want the, the sheepskin to be wet and ground around to dry. Now I want the, I want the ground around to be wet and the sheepskin dry. You know, the sheep fleece. That's what he's talking about. And that's, that's, so that's why we get up the concept of putting out fleece. Now listen, that was Old Testament. But what does he say to us? What are we what are we instructed to do in the New Testament? We are instructed to walk by faith and not by sight. So we shouldn't be putting out fleeces today. But rather, we should take God at his word. You see, you see that progress, how God, how, how God progressed, made people progress, or, or people should progress in their dealings or their reactions to God. And so this, 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 this idea of sacred space, he required that in the Old Testament in ancient times. But here, Jesus here makes a fundamental shift. He's saying that sacred space is no longer relevant because God is spirit and they that worship him must wish of him, not according to the space, not according to cosmic geography, but they must worship him in spirit and in truth. For God desires those who wish him. So, so what did he say? What did Jesus say? He, he said, Jesus said, and I, and I challenge you to read this text, study this text. Jesus said the hour is coming and had come when the place of worship would be of no consequence or is no consequence. The where worship, here or there, in a church building or not, is no consequence. Now listen, let me share something with you. Now just because you don't have to come to church, to a church building to worship God, that does not mean you should not Go to a church building to worship. Because listen, you need the fellowship of other believers. And other believers, you, 
listen, <laughs> let's be honest. You ain't gonna want folk coming to your house. Okay. Uh, we, I, I think we should at the church sometimes do, uh, do um, fellowship meetings at home, in homes. I think it would tremendously help the fellowship of the church to meet in homes. That's what the New Testament church did. They didn't have buildings. Okay. Well, I'm simply saying the the building is a convenience, but according to Jesus, is not a necessity. Because sacred space is no longer relevant in worshiping or encountering God. Why? Because Jesus in Pentecost made the difference. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. And since Pentecost, Guess what? God, the, through the Holy Spirit, indwells the hearts of redeemed humanity. Therefore, here it is. Not that church building. Not that mountain. Not Mount Gerizim. It's not Mount Zion. It's not Jerusalem. It's not the, not the shrine of Turin. It's not these, any of these sacred spots that we talk about. But each and every true believer is sacred space. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 3, 16, he says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Now, hear the word in that particular verse, it, the, the you is plural. He's talking about them, them collectively. So that when we assemble as a, as a group, God is in the midst. God is among us. God is in us. He's referring to believers collectively. But here, here in the next text, in uh, chapter six, he's talking about individuals. He says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Listen. When we engage in sexual intercourse with a person, it's not just a transference of bodily fluids or a mesh of bodies. It is a transference of spirit, of spirit. You literally become one with that person. And this is why. This is why God intended for the sexual union to be only between two individuals for a lifetime. It could be the reason why so many people messed up is because they've been with so many people and all those spirits are, are, have, been, have been merged into their spirit. So collectively and individually, believers are the temples of God. We are Sacred, we are the sacred space, not the church building, but the people of God, individually and collectively, sacred space. So as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Remember, there was no sacred space in Eden as far as a building or mountain, because all of Eden was sacred space. There will be no sacred space in New Jerusalem. John says in, in Revelation 21 and 22, he says, I, I saw no temple in the city. For the, his temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And so as we conclude tonight, listen, uh, hopefully, and as I said earlier, you know, we, we weren't going to go too deep into this, just, just, just enough to just hit the edges, and hopefully you will do some more in-depth study. Uh, really into this concept of sacred space and how the individual believers and believers collectively now are sacred space as opposed to church buildings or temples or shrines. So hopefully this study has helped us to understand the biblical history and the contemporary absence of sacred space. Because the important thing today is not so much where we wish it, but that we worship God daily through our lives.
Paul says something significant, and I think we missed this. This is something we missed, that we missed. It, it's in Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. And I want to read that uh, as we conclude. But Paul says, you know, he, and I, now in, in, chapter, in Romans chapter 1 through 11, he's talking about all what God has done. Talk about the peace and the grace of God, how God has redeemed us, and how God did all this. You know, because the Romans, he's, he's, he's sharing the gospel, the story of God's goodness. And so, what he's basically doing in verse uh, chapter 12, verse 1, he said, based on what God has done, based on what I just told you in the, in the prior, previous 11 chapters, here is how you should respond. He says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So Paul is saying, in essence, true worship is the presentation of our lives to God and God's service every day as a living sacrifice. True worship is not going to church on Sunday and bowing and praying and singing and all that kind of stuff. He's saying real worship is our lives dedicated to God. And so sacred space is no longer a requirement for worship. But we must worship in spirit and truth for the Father seeks such worship. Because when we worship in spirit and in truth, we recognize that God is everywhere. And that more importantly, that if we are saved, if we are redeemed, if we are believers, the very spirit of God, the spirit that makes these places sacred, that spirit, he is in us. And therefore, we ourselves are sacred space. Wow, that was heavy, you know, uh, just even think of that concept. Well, listen, I pray and hope again that uh, this has been a blessing to you. It was, listen, it was a blessing to me uh, getting this stuff together uh, and to share with you. And listen, I'm learning as you're learning. I don't don't think that I know everything. I don't come off and don't try to think I know everything. I am learning as I grow uh, in God. And it's an exciting journey. And I'm just thrilled to share it with you. Well, God bless you. Listen, I pray and hope you share this video on your timeline. Because if it's been a blessing to you, It'll be a blessing to someone else. So in the next, until the next time, our prayer is that God will bless you real good. Be blessed.